Open Startup. Uh, I'm very pleased to be moderating this particular group. My education background includes a number of years at Oregon State University's Open Source Lab, helping establish and grow that from a startup. And I'm familiar with the pain points and also the incredible return uh, you get when you start something new that's beneficial to both uh, students and faculty alike and, and the university system. So uh, we're going to have uh, our panelists today each do a brief presentation to give you context and background from their initiative. We want to spend most of this hour listening to your questions and having an interactive discussion. So if it seems like they're speed dating, it's just because everyone wants to be <laughs> understated in their initiative and then make sure we have a lot of time to share within the community. So I'm going to let the panelists introduce them, themselves as well. And Joel, we're going to start with you. So come take the podium. And Uh, thanks, Deb. Um, so I'm the uh, engineering manager for uh, the open source team at edX. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, walk you through a little bit of the uh, history and uh, status of the open edX project uh, at edX. Um, so when we refer to open edX, um, it's a phrase that has a lot of different meanings. And it has there are some things that it explicitly doesn't mean. Um, so we refer to uh, the platform, the open source uh, platform that edX uh, initially open sourced and has uh, hundreds of contributors around the world now. Um, there's uh, the project, uh, the people, the documentation, all of the things that go into making the platform uh, usable, and the uh, community around it, um, the people who are installing it, who are putting courses on it, who are delivering um, different uh, educational experiences, uh, really in ways that you know edX uh, never really uh, envisioned when um, it initially created uh, the Open edX platform. Um, so this is a quick history so uh, of both edX as an organization and uh, Open edX, the platform. Uh, so it started, uh, development on the platform started in November 2011. Um, this was uh, Anand Agarwal and uh, his team at uh, CSAIL at MIT. Um, but he delivered the first uh, MOOC on the platform in uh, March of 2012. Uh, and then following that, you know, before it was even named edX, uh, following that edX was incorporated, uh, created by uh, MIT and Harvard uh, as this uh, open, massive open online course uh, platform. Um, so at, in January 2013, uh, 20 MOOCs, 500,000 learners, a uh, huge milestone there. Um, and then June 2013 was really the inception of the open source aspect of the platform. Now, from the beginning, Anant and his team uh, always intended to open source the platform, but there, uh, you know, that was a project in and of itself. Was you know, you, software does not you do not simply release a piece of software as open source and say, okay, that's it. You know, here it is. Uh, so there's a lot of work that went into that. Um, and uh, so June 2013, and then uh, October 2014. Uh, we had uh, 40 different open edX sites, uh, aside from edX.org, uh, 500 courses on those uh, sites. And then uh, this past September, um, 5 million learners on edX.org, 140 open edX sites. So you see over the course of a year, uh, 100 new sites and uh, four time, almost four times as many courses. Um, so this is just a, a representative of a number of the different platforms and partners. Uh, you can see um, Gakko from Japan, Ionis X from uh, France, uh, Stanford University, uh, Harvey Mudd, um, you know, uh, GW, uh, tons of other uh, universities and uh, corporate sites and uh, other um, organizations interested in uh, helping the world learn essentially. So how did we uh, get started uh, as an open source project? So our first uh, customer, and I, I say this, you know, we, we do think about uh, the community as our uh, customer in, in the uh, open source team. Uh, you know, we really want to provide uh, service to them and enable them to go out and help us achieve uh, edX, uh, the nonprofit organization's mission of educating uh, a billion people. Um, and you know we, we, we understand that that is not a, a reasonable uh, uh, that is not a possible goal for edX.org as a single site. That is something that is going to happen through a network of hundreds upon hundreds of sites and people going out into different markets and different languages and different 
um, you know, learning uh, styles that you know, we would never be able to think of ourselves. So first customer, uh, we think of uh, Stanford University. They came to us and they said, you know, we really love that platform. We want to use your software. Please, if you open source it, we will use it. So uh, we did. Uh, we open sourced the platform, uh, made it available to Stanford. They're, they have been an incredible um, contributor over the years. They're uh, one of the largest contributors to the platform. Um, and we're actually, uh, since uh, people have been talking about their uh, conferences, we have the Open Edx conference at Stanford, uh, June 14th to 17th. Uh, you can find me uh, if you want to know more about that. But um, we, uh, they, after about a year or so, uh, they had uh, learned a lot. Um, we had learned a lot about being an open source project, uh, and they actually commissioned uh, a study as sort of a way to give us feedback about uh, how edX was doing as sort of an organization that was effectively, you know, operating as the sole governing body of this open source project. Uh, there's a great document out there uh, making Open edX a thriving uh, open source project uh, written by Nate Ani, a uh, member of our community, uh, commissioned by Stanford. Uh, we also have a response uh, published on our blog that sort of walks through the different things that we um, have done, we had done up to that point to address those things and we're continuing to uh, work through um, this document, but I think uh, you know at this point we've actually addressed most of the major items here. So some of the things that we took away uh, from that report: uh, creating KPIs for what success looks like. Are we? Are you trying to optimize? Are you trying to increase the number of contributions? Trying to uh, decrease the time from uh, someone sort of proposing a contribution to when it actually gets merged into the platform? Um, are you just trying to target the sheer number of users of the platform? Uh, maybe all of those things. Uh, you want to track all of those things. Uh, depending on what your goals are. Um, making public the default. So this is a really big thing for us. Uh, I'm sure it's a big thing for a lot of uh, open source projects. It's not uh, an easy thing for a lot of organizations. Um, you know, edX is a nonprofit organization, so this is somewhat easier for us than it might be for, that, for a um, for-profit organization, but uh, certainly, you know, we're following, uh, we're trying to walk the walk that, uh, you know, Jim Whitehurst was talking about earlier and uh, talking about an open organization uh, you know, all of our uh, bug reports are public, all of our uh, feature discussions, our architectural conversations, uh, they happen on a wiki. Um, we're proposing, you know, a more uh, formal open process for proposing changes to the platform um, and really trying to get as much feedback from the community um, as possible because they're, they have different use cases than us, they have different ideas about how the platform should grow, and we know that we are never going to be um, able to come up with everything that a much larger community of people would be able to come up with. And so we want to make public the default and make those things uh, as available for people to give feedback and to share their ideas on as possible. Um, and then creating public accessible spaces and <clears throat> being there to interact with people. Um, this is a huge thing. Uh, you know, the, the story that I tell about this, uh, the accessible part is really interesting. Um, so we had uh, an IRC channel on uh, Freenode, um, you know, hashtag, uh, channel edX code or whatever. Uh, there was maybe on average around 40 people there and someone would ask a question maybe every other day or so. Uh, we recently, we moved to Slack, uh, taking advantage of their um, program for uh, open source projects and nonprofit organizations. Uh, we have uh, over 700 people on our Slack channel, on our Slack team now. Um, and that just is because people, you know, IRC has this, uh, you know, maybe undeserved, but it has a, a certain connotation of being, uh, you know, sort of not user friendly, difficult to use. People really like sort of the social features that Slack includes. Um, and that has just tremendously grown the amount of interaction between um, people in the engineering organization at edX. Uh, and the rest of the community. Um, and it's really just sort of broken down those, those walls. Um, so just a quick snapshot of where we are today. We're at over 240 open edX instances. So that's over 100 new instances in the last seven or eight months. Um, hundreds of external contributors, uh, 2,000 plus people on our uh, edX code mailing list, the main one where most of uh, discussions happen in sort of a more formal manner, and then uh, the sort of real-time communication on a Slack team. This actually, I, when I wrote this like a week ago, it was 600, and we just hit over 700. 
Um, so we've had four uh, OpenEdX platform releases, and this actually, uh, it's funny, I, I did not plan this, I did not know Jim was gonna be talking about this earlier. Uh, so he was talking about the, you know, adding the value of, um, you know, support and uh, maintenance, and, you know, that's really what we're trying to do with the OpenEdX platform uh, releases. So we do uh, three releases a year, where we take a point in time and we say, the platform at this point in time, we give it a name. The current one is Dogwood, they're uh, based on tree names. And uh, we say, you know, this is what we, we as a community are going to support and focus on um, until the next release comes out. Um, and almost 13 million learners, so that's uh, across both edX.org and the open edX community. Uh, you know, there's, it's only a matter of time before there are more uh, learners on open edX sites than uh, edX.org itself, uh, and we expect that uh, trajectory to continue uh, up and to the right. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Diane Fisher. Hi, I'm Diana Fisher. I am the director of Open Oregon State at Oregon State University. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of background on um, what we do and why we decided to do it. So we did enter into a partnership with the OSU Press and the OSU Libraries to um, try to address the cost of uh, education for students. As you all probably know, the uh, cost of tuition keeps going up. We can't do much about controlling the cost of tuition, but we can try to do something about controlling the cost of course materials for students. And so, if anyone has, um, has entered into um, the world of open textbooks, one of the criticisms that faculty generally have about open textbooks is that they are not peer reviewed. And so with our partnership with our university press, the textbooks that we publish go through uh, the regular editorial process of the press, so they get all those benefits and they are also free to students. For the faculty, it is a benefit because the texts get listed in the OSU Press catalog just as any other book published by the University Press. And we have also managed to create a partnership with our university bookstore. So our university bookstore is a nonprofit bookstore and it, um, <clears throat> it exists to, to provide the course materials for the students, but it also gives back a portion of, of its uh, profits. When I had a conversation with the textbook manager about how we were going to deal with um, my unit creating open textbooks and also getting faculty to use open textbooks, um, I thought that I was going to get a lot of pushback from him thinking that it was going to cut into his profits. But as I sat there and I talked with him and explained what we were going to do, he said, no, that's really, that's great. Um, <clears throat> he said, our, our profits actually are made off t-shirts and other, you know, university logoed things. Mm -hmm. So if students spend less money on textbooks, they'll buy more t-shirts. I don't know if that's what's happened, but um, that's how we got the buy-in from the bookstore. And so every term, as a faculty member decides to open, uh, adopt an open textbook, the bookstore actually lists those in their course materials. So when a student goes digitally to the university bookstore's website to see what they need, they get a link to an open textbook, to an OpenStax textbook, to any open textbook. Um, they also will get a link um, to any journal articles so the student doesn't have to go all the way through a process of buying a packet of materials either that are going to cost money when they're just a, um, a journal article that they can search for through the university's uh, library databases. So we also do some other, other um, uh, free open OER, um, and I mean both free and open. Um, anything that we make, you can take and you can adapt, you can adopt it, you can change it, you can remix it, you can do anything that you want with it. So right now we have over 40 modules completed and the learning modules are things, um, some are specific like how to choose the right irrigation system for your area. 
um, how to start a business. We created four learning modules. Um, someone came to us and said, we've got a group of Spanish-speaking women who are stay-at-home moms, and they want to start their own business. So <clears throat> this faculty member worked with with these women and worked with our engineering department and worked with communities and walked through a whole process how these women could create their own business. Um, it was it was a food business, but the engineering department um, created a machine for them to, to be able to streamline things. So after they walked through that whole process, we created a set of four learning modules in Spanish to help other women do this too, and those are, are available for free. Um, we completed two textbooks at this time. Um, one is uh, about how to um, deal with earthquakes, so it's earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest. We have another one that's on wildlife habitat management, and nine additional textbooks are in development right now. Um, the textbooks also, that doesn't count the ones that we're using from OpenStax or from anywhere else. So what we've decided to do with our textbook um, program and why we got some of the faculty buy-in is we are a land-grant institution. And for those of you who don't know what a land-grant institution is, we got back in 1862, we received federal funds and federal land to start a university. And the university's mission as a land grant is to provide education in agriculture, engineering, um, military science, so ROTC, and several other practical. And so we do have, you know, obviously we have all the other subjects too, but because of that uh, land grant institution, we have the duty to give back. And so as we talked with faculty and told them, you know, this is part of your land grant mission, our mission for the university is to do research and to share it with the public. And so it was a little bit easier sell um, at a public university, at a public land grant. So we also have 20 open courses available. These are courses completely free. You can log in, you can take them. They are on everything from, um, let's see, basics of grant writing, which is a course that's taken by a lot of grad students. And then again, we have a lot of other agriculture. We have some training courses that are free. Um, we have the food handler certificate that's out there for free. Uh, that anyone who deals with food needs to go take a test about. And we did two MOOCs. And you all know, I'm sure you're familiar with the hype about MOOCs. And we kept saying, no, we're not going to do one, no, we're not going to do one. But two opportunities came to us and we decided that we would actually try to do one. The first one was because in the state of Oregon, all teachers had to be trained on a new standard if you were a teacher of English as a second language. And so we have a lot of K-12 teachers in the state. So we worked with our Department of Education to create a big MOOC that was for just the teachers. And this way, the, the Department of Education did not have to travel the state and teach all of them these new standards. The second one that we did, the one that listed here has over 16,000 participants. We did a little bit of research. We worked with one of our faculty members in horticulture, and he teaches an intro to permaculture course. And we decided that we would put that one up as a MOOC because uh, we have a non-credit certificate in permaculture that it could lead to, and we also have an online horticulture degree. So we used this MOOC as a way to introduce the topic to get the topic to those that need it, and also to, to um, I guess, satisfy his need to get the topic out there. So we did get 16,000, oh, actually over 16,000 participants, and I can't tell you how many um, have finished because the course is, uh, is going right now, but there are participants from all over the world in it. So we actually have decided that we will keep doing these kinds of courses, these kinds of open resources, but what we really want to do is concentrate on the textbooks because we feel that we can make the biggest impact on students here. So again, we can't control the cost of tuition, but we can control the cost of the course materials. We have a partnership with our university press, which is a huge selling point for faculty. Uh, several of us spent some time talking with our legislature this year, and after uh, their whole session, the legislature did give us $700,000 to work with faculty to uh, incentivize them. 
And our faculty actually care about student success. So I wrote down a couple of notes here on that one that I wanted to talk about and, and shortly um, give you some information on. Nicole was at uh, an event that we had when we first decided that we were going to um, w or we were ready to bring our unit out to everyone. We had kind of flown under the radar for a while, grabbed those early adopters and got some things going. But then we said, hey, let's have an event at the university where we talk about what open textbooks are and how important they can be to students. So we rented a room with about 30 people, could fit in it 30 to 50 people, and we ordered some stuff from catering, and we put a sign-up sheet online for interested faculty to register and to hear about what open, textbook, open textbooks were and how they could get involved. By the end of the first week, we had, uh, I think, 170 faculty members signed up, and the day of the event, we had 240 show up. So we obviously had to get a bigger room. We figured that faculty were very interested in doing what they could to impact students. Um, and so with our current project maturity and how we got faculty buy-in, it was kind of the early adopters and the early adopters talked about um, the impact that they were having. A couple of the stories that we had faculty talk to others about, we had a business a faculty member in marketing who said that at the end of the term he told his 300 um, student class that they were welcome to bring their textbooks to the final exam. They could use them uh, for, for the exam. He said after the class just a little over half the students contacted him to say that they were sharing that $300 textbook with their friends. So did he have a textbook that they could borrow for the exam? <laughs> so he actually, he said, well, he looked at the, the previous versions of the textbooks that he had in his office, and he went around the College of Business at the university and got the previous five versions of the textbook from every faculty member in the college who had one because as he said, really they hadn't changed the last five versions. So the price kept going up, but they hadn't changed much in the book. So he was able to help all those students get them. Um, and the other, shared governance. I've talked with our faculty senate several times and they, they decided that they would give a formal support to, um, to the project, to our unit. And for student incentives, this year our student government has made a big push. They've had demonstrations, they've had rallies, they've got some of our legislatures uh, to come meet at the university and talk uh, with the rest of the faculty and the administration. We do have our administration, our higher administration, who are supportive, including our president. And when the students sat up there and they, they pointed out a couple things at their last rally. So all the students fall term who had bought the chemistry book, which I think was somewhere around $350, pointed out that they could not sell that chemistry book back at the end of the term, so they paid Pretty, pretty hefty amount for a chemistry book that was now no good because as soon as they added those two or three elements to the periodic table of elements, that textbook was out of date. So even though they had just bought it a few weeks before, it was now no good and they couldn't sell it back. So they had a copy of the OpenStax chemistry book and they said if we had had this OpenStax chemistry book, it had been updated the next day, and we wouldn't have had to waste all that money. So students pushing for it also. So that's the overview of my project and where we are, and I have much more information if you have questions later. I know someone earlier had asked a question of Nicole about um, incentives and money and how to pay for faculty, so I can actually address that later if you would like. Diana, Steve Jacobs. Howdy. So a lot of the discussions today have been around uh, infrastructure and tools, which is great. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about curriculum and students and student activities and things like that. So um, through an accident of fate, uh, just to talk about appearances for a moment um, and why things are the way they are at RIT, uh, I was generously interviewed by Computer World a couple of months ago about open source education along with another 
set of faculty members. And I had my photo there, and one of the comments on the article was, Professor Jacobs's picture should probably be in the dictionary right next to sysadmin because he looks like the definition of a sysadmin. <laughs> Um, so appearance is being deceiving. Uh, I am a full professor in the Golisano College of Computing. Uh, I am a filmmaker gone horribly wrong with no PhD and a master's degree in media studies. So I'm about as far from a sysadmin as you can get. And in fact, did not engage with open source until I wanted my game students, because that's what I really do. I, uh, I teach game design at RIT in the School of Interactive Games and Media. Um, but I wanted in 2008, 2009, how many people remember the OLPC XO? All right, so not many of you. This was an MIT consortium effort to create a laptop, an affordable laptop for developing nations. The idea being not so much that everybody should learn to code, but that if you live in a one-room schoolhouse environment, that you don't have a chem lab or a library or any of those things that you could do with a laptop, right? The laptop could become the music room and the chem lab when you put sensors into it and went out and measured the, uh, the pH of the river water you were drinking and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a, a great book on how that project succeeded and failed called Learning to Save the World that I recommend to everyone, especially those who want to be social entrepreneurs because it's a great case study for what was successful and not successful. So I wanted to have my kids make educational games. There was a call for uh, them to build external entities because the hardware and the software and the curriculum were all open source. And Interestingly, this was not kernel work, and in 2008, 2009, when I went to my IT support in my game lab and said, hey, I want to put all this open source software on our network, uh, they screamed in horror, and they wouldn't let me do anything, and through a program, uh, what ran under the hood of the operating system, the GUI called Sugar in the OLPC, was Fedora, and the Fedora community had a hundred laptops to give away to people who wanted to contribute educational curriculum to this. And through a, a very long story, they ended up drop shipping me 25 machines and they all peer to peer together anyway. So I had my network without upsetting uh, the IT folks who run my labs. Of course, they all had to be whitelisted on the network, but that's another story. Um, so we started there and students got excited uh, so it moved from a seminar to a formal course. And then two things happened. You know, all of this has been student driven. So after the second or third iteration of the course, um, RIT is a co-op school, cooperative education. Students have to have paid work in the field to graduate. And so they came to me and they said, we want to keep working on this game we made in class. Can you build us a co-op? And they're supposed to be paid, but I bent some rules, so that we can keep working on our game. And then they went and took the course again, took it as in they just showed up, started tutoring the other students in Pi Game and all of the other horrors, and started recruiting people to work on their game. So as an educator, I looked at this and I said, this is freaking educational gold, right? If you can get people to do this on their own, you won. So how can I leverage this? So we had another course. And then they said, well, could we get a minor in this? And I said, okay, I'll go and build a minor with some other colleagues. And we have a, a minor in free and open source software and free culture, which is the first minor in the country, as far as we can tell, all about this. And it is designed to be non-technical. Several of the courses are contributed from liberal arts. Um, because we're in games, the introductory course will make use of people with animation and writing and all other kinds of backgrounds. So they don't have to be coders. And you can make your way through the five courses without ever being a programmer. Because to me, open source is much broader than coding. And to me, I didn't want to make a bachelor's degree because open source to me is about process and community. It's not about skill sets. And for me, skill, you know, bachelor's degree is narrow skill set. Minors can be broad and across. Does that make sense, everybody? So that's where we are on the educational side. But that's not just what we do. Um, they wanted to do hackathons. So we did a lot of them. Uh, we continue to do a lot of them. 
uh, we began to bring in speakers. Um, so we've had Stallman and Abelson and Walter Bender who created Sugar and is still running Sugar as an educational environment off of the OLPC hardware. We've had a bunch of different things. So that's the second leg, this kind of community practice. And the third leg to the three-legged stool of what we do is student employment, where um, I'm able to hire some students part-time to work on their own projects. And because RIT is a co-op institution, uh, we have this program called LibreCorps. Several years ago, by accident, um, we started providing co-ops for students in open source. And then we found partners. One of my partners that really inspired this latest move was UNICEF Innovation. How many people know the, uni the innovation wing of UNICEF? Um, you should. You should Google them. They have a great set of nine principles about innovation for developing nations. And number six of the nine principles is open everything, open source, open data, all that stuff. So in your spare time, Google UNICEF Innovation and Principles, and you'll find that creed there, which is pretty cool. And so we sent two kids to Kosovo uh, to go work on the ground in a country office. We've had some students uh, work on site at RIT as well, and we've done a lot of other kind of ad hoc co-ops, and so we've branded this thing called LibreCorps, where I'm now creating kind of one-off co-ops for students to do humanitarian work and hoping to build essentially a lab that's uh, year-round where I have students who can be on call for humanitarian projects rather than trying to find a specific job to slot them into. Um, so the ones we're doing this year are, uh, how many of you know Enable or Enabling the Future? This is one of the efforts that prints 3D hands for kids who don't have them. So we work with Enable and we work with Enable to place in a local charter school that's an all boys inner city high school uh, a program on how to print hands is kind of a job careers thing. Uh, this time around we'll also be working with uh, Open APS and Night Scout. How many of you know those? applications. So these are folks who are trying to make a um, essentially an artificial pancreas for people who have diabetes and those projects work on that. There's software projects that work on the hardware. Um, lots more to talk about but not a lot more time to talk until later. So where are we going? Um, I need to get my fingers more into other colleges on campus. I do pull some of their students but I want to make that more active by running a speaker series this year that's targeted to every one of my nine colleges so that we'll have something on op open APS and Night Scout for the Medical Technology College. We'll have somebody perhaps from OSI and or Software Convergence or Conservancy or Open Innovation come talk about business things, right? We'll, we'll have Red Hat's uh, Mo Duffy who's in charge of their HCI and graphics come talk about graphic arts and working with open source tools as a professional, those types of things. We're gonna start moving some of the stuff in the minor. We're gonna fork it and evolve it into a post-baccalaureate online certificate. So we're probably developing the first course for that this summer. And the Libre core goal is to get it right on my campus and then move it to other campuses. Um, how should you get started? Just do something. Pick one of those three legs, whatever is easiest for you, a seminar course, hosting a couple hackathons, whatever you can get started on your campus, you're going to find the students are going to end up driving you like they did me. And I think that is all. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Our final panelist, Beth Harris. So um, I'm going to just talk really briefly in lieu of Stephen Zucker, who couldn't be here today. And the moral of my three to five minutes about smart history is going to be that actually not knowing what you're doing can sometimes be a very good thing. And that definitely describes my last 10 years at smart history. So before smart history, just a little background, smart history was part of Khan Academy, which some of you may know. Uh, before that, I was at the director of, distance Le director of digital learning at the Museum of Modern Art, and before that, a tenured professor. So a lot of different hats. So quickly, smart history. Can I ask how many of you know what smart history is? OK. Um, smart history is an open educational resource. I think it's fair to say that we're the most widely used um, open educational resource for the study of, of art history um, and cultural history. We got started uh, in 2005 literally just for our 200 students. 
Um, so here's a good example of not knowing what we were doing. And basically, with the idea that opening up classrooms would make me a better teacher. So I was really frustrated by the fact that I could see what my colleagues were doing in the classroom, what my art history colleagues were doing in the classroom, only when I had to assess them, right? Only when I had to do a peer evaluation. But every time I did one of those peer evaluations, I was like, whoa, holy shit, I just learned a whole lot about a really good way to teach Baroque art from this teacher. So um, Stephen and I started sitting in on each other's classes, started talking about doing that more, and eventually basically took the online courses that we were making and put them in front of Blackboard. We just actually it was Angel at the time. <laughs> um, and just put them out there um, using Blogger first and then WordPress and eventually ModX, now back on WordPress. Um, so basically just to be a better teacher was how it started, just for a couple of hundred students. Um, we now have, um, I think there's some, yeah, there we go, 1,500 pieces of content contributed by more than 200 art historians. We use Trello for project management. 13.5 million views, so I could say I think I could say I used to teach a couple of hundred students, and now I teach millions. I think that might be a fair thing to say. Um, we have more YouTube subscriptions than every art museum subscribers than every art museum um, in the United States and Europe, except for MoMA and Tate. Two art historians. That's it. Not bad. Um, let's see. Um, and we also doubled our YouTube views in about the last 18 months. Um, our these are uh, institutions we've worked with. Not all of them have been easy to work with. That's one of the challenges, I think, has been working, being open, and being um, you know, agile is really hard for museums and universities and um, sort of legacy analog institutions. Um, so our key strategies, we had no idea what we were doing. Turned out to be a good thing. No grand strategy. We didn't apply for a giant grant. I think our first website was 20, built with $20,000 and it lasted about eight years, something like that. Um, did a lot with very little. Um, used scrappy tools. We used what was out there, YouTube, Flickr, whatever was out there. Didn't invent anything. Um, involving our community of art historians. I think we've done that successfully. Challenges, as I've said, working with older institutions that take a year and a half to decide something. Um, and at Khan Academy, the motto was sort of billions are waiting. You know, billions of people are waiting for this great free learning content, and especially the arts, which don't get taught regularly in, in public schools or only in elite institutions. Um, and I think the other um, sort of problem for us is that we're an independent not-for-profit that does this. We're not connected to a university or college. We're not a museum. Those are the kinds of institutions that do this. So exactly who or what are we, I think, is, is a, has been a problem for us. The other big problem has been um, open access images, which have come along in the last few years, but there's still a lot of like, things that students have to know have to study when they take any art history course. Art History 101, Giotto's Arena Chapel, good luck finding nice photographs of it. And that's true of so many great works of art that students have to study. Thank God for Flickr, that's, that's been our savior. Um, and that's about it. I'm happy to answer any questions about smart history and how we got started. All right, thanks. So you've heard from a broad range of initiatives. You're welcome to ask questions that are specific to the project, but also we're looking to help generalize some of the experience to help people start their own local. Do, I, do we have any immediate questions out of the audience? See someone, do you want to come to the mic? I believe we're being recorded that we can. We come can on down. Voice. Come on. I was wondering, how do you approach the professors that sound like the seagulls from Finding Nemo, where all they scream is mine, they want to own everything, all of their own websites, all of their own course materials, and anytime a student wants to use something outside the course, they're like, no, you can't, it's mine. Who would like to take that? You want to start, Stephen? I, I can start. <coughs> so as I described earlier, um, since we are a land-grant institution, uh, faculty are used to sharing. Um, a lot of that is written right into their position descriptions. 
And so um, <clears throat> there are a couple of, uh, I guess, kind of ways that I do approach some. Uh, the ones that I really want to get some content from, and they do have that my uh, my research, my thing. And one of one of the ways that I've approached this that's worked with several is that um, I remind them. I kind of work on their ego, I guess. I remind them that you know they are the expert in this topic. And let's just use something uh, like honeybee. Um, because honeybee die-off is in the news a lot lately. So I say, you know, you are the expert. You've done a ton of research on honeybee health and what's going on with them. Why do you want to write a journal article that only the others who are working on honeybee die-off are going to read? Why, why shouldn't we take this and get it out there to the millions of people who have backyard hives the, um, the millions of hobbyists who are out there trying to combat this too. Uh, and so sometimes that works, you know, because then they realize that their, their uh, research will get out and it's not gonna be taken in their, in their journal format. You know, we work with them to, um, in, in this one, we could take it all the way down to a level for uh, elementary school children and work on it in several different ways and if they want to be known as the expert at that uh, or in their topic, then having it in a journal where only a couple of other people are going to read it isn't really going to get their name out there the way that it would if it was open. And sometimes that works. Thanks. Thank, thanks All right, for so, you know, it's, so I come from a private institution, which in theory should not share because it's private and evil and horrible. Um, but we have kind of a different institutional mindset. Uh, five plus or minus two years ago, um, RIT changed its IP policy so that we were one of the first universities in the nation, private institutions anyway that gave all IP rights to their students, no matter what they worked on, no matter whose equipment they used, whether it was for a course or not, with the only exception of if they were obviously working on funded research from, from us or from somebody else, and they did not retain their rights. Otherwise, they retain all their rights. And, you know, most of my faculty feel the same way. Uh, the sciences seem to be a little bit more open about the mind thing. I've found with liberal arts professors, flaming their rage against academic publishers works really well. <laughs> um, Hal, Hal Abelson of MIT has a great presentation on the evils of academic publishing, and you should invite him to your institution. Uh, so those are all things that help. Thanks. Anybody else? Beth? I think just, um, you know, the line that I did about, you know, I used to teach 200 students a year, and now I teach a couple of million, usually works well, you know, when you, you know, getting, getting out your research, getting out, you know, your approach to a topic, that sort of, that, that seems to work sometimes, not always. Thank you. Another question here. Um, Dana, I'm impressed with what you guys are doing at OSU. Uh, I just wanted to ask, as kind of a neophyte, can you give me some insight on how the press works economically? The, our university press? Yeah. Um, not in great detail, but they, um, generally what our press publishes, they, they have areas of emphasis, and it's really Pacific Northwest history, uh, forestry, agriculture, that sort of thing, which is, um, all of our areas at um, at the university. So the things that we generally are teaching are um, areas of emphasis, the things that we're known for. And so that's what our press also publishes. So our press acts just like any other university press. I mean, they, they are profit. Um, okay. I was just wondering, because I was worried that they might be funded by the tuition that's constantly increasing. No, absolutely increasing. not. They're, they're a university <laughs> press, just like you know Harvard Press or or anyone else. Uh, it's just that I I was able to um, partner with them. So what we do that's open is available absolutely online uh, at no cost whatsoever. But they do have print versions of what we 
have done. The difference is obviously the press doesn't put out a new version every time we change something online. And is there any opportunity, I mean, as the press is publishing and making profit on the other print materials that they do, they're basically subsidizing the cost of the free textbooks or? Uh, no, those were actually done separately. So um, because we, we are the land grant institution, I was, oh, I was able to get some funding from um, our university outreach and engagement and also the funding that I got from the legislature. And so that, um, that funding I used in advance to kind of prepay what we, um, what we had thought would be royalties. So faculty are getting an upfront sum and, um, and then they do get royalties off print versions that are sold just like any other print version. But because everything is available for free, I mean you can download a PDF and, and read it. Um, because that is available for free, we gave them sort of upfront royalties. And depending on um, a rubric that we used for that to figure it out, um, we did things like um, what was the price of the textbook that it would be replacing, uh, how many students are enrolled um, per year. So we looked at the impact that creating an open textbook would make, um, and we figured it out. And our funding we gave was up to $10,000, so it really wasn't a huge amount of money, especially if they were writing something from the beginning. Um, but a lot of the faculty who did this also either had not found a good text out there or who were having to um, assign several texts with chapters from each. So once they worked with colleagues, and this is another area also where we got a lot of collaboration to work with faculty, um, not only their peers at the institution but outside the institution to create what they really wanted. Thanks for the insight. All right, thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Maite Basagur and I am an art historian and my question is for uh, Dr. Harris. Um, I am a teacher of art history and I think, I'm pretty sure I've seen all your videos. They are wonderful. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. But I have a couple of questions for Especially you. Especially the old ones, you know. <laughs> you do something for long enough and you get better at it. But in the beginning they were terrible. But anyway. I, I found it very, very helpful. And my students uh, uh, find them helpful too. So my first question would be, you start every uh, video stating that you are physically <clears throat> at either Athens or Italy or all over the yeah, world. I have a good job. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you are physically in all those places. Yes, we, we, used, we actually started making videos in Stephen's office, art history office, we'd open a textbook. And then we quickly realized that whenever we were in the museum, we were way better. Um, so, and part of, part of I, th I think what we can do with the technology is, is bring the, the student to those places, the sound of the place, the feel of a place, the feeling of an aesthetic experience. So we, we found it really valuable to be on location. There is no any kind of advertisement on your video. So are, do, how, how there are you? There never will be, yeah. How, how do you fund this? By, with so, so basically, um, we funded it for about six or seven years. Um, my husband, who's in the audience, did our IT support um, and designed our first website. We did it evenings and weekends and vacations. And um, basically, it grew into a full-time job. And then one day, I, I sent a snarky tweet to Sal Khan saying, of Khan Academy saying, um, if, if art was as important as math, smart history would get more attention. And um, so he hired us, and we went to work there. Nice. That was a very good day. That was like Christmas and Hanukkah and birthday all wrapped up in one. So we were finally were able to do smart history full time, thanks to Sal Khan and Khan Academy for almost four years. And that gave us enough of a launching pad to be able to find funding. So now we're funded by private donors, John and Ann Dorr from Silicon Valley. Um, College Board recently gave us a, a significant donation. Um, and grants from the Cress and Mellon Foundation. And hopefully all of that will continue and expand. And there is a donate button. <laughs> okay. My last question, yeah. I, I, I promise. Um, where, 
is a smart history going? Because this is really very helpful tool, and there is nothing like that in Spanish or any kind oh, so, yeah. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, so we are being translated. Um, and if you go to Khan Academy slash ES, I think, um, you may see some of the videos translated um, and at least captioned in Spanish. And is that what you mean by where we're going? Yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, we would love to have more translations. We would love that. And in fact, that would be a, a good grant line to pursue. But at the moment, the focus is really on expanding global coverage. So Stephen and I, as you probably know, both do Western 19th and 20th century art. And there's a whole long history of art and lots of other people who make art. So um, thanks to the Mellon Foundation, we were able to expand Africa, Oceania, um, the South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, you know, basically all of those areas. And I think that's gonna take us another year or two to really um, have enough of that so we feel solid in that area. I think that's the, that's the focus now. Thank you. This, but if you have another idea for focus, we should talk. Yeah. Yes. We and should. if you want to contribute, <laughs> we should talk. We should definitely. Okay. I'm, I'm going to wait for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I've learned two things. One, we can add daring someone to do the right thing to a strategy to getting started. Uh, and then I have a question, for, a follow-up question for Beth. Would it be possible to crowdsource something like translating your current material into foreign yeah, languages? Khan Academy does actually use crowdsourcing to translate. So I do think, but of course the math and science videos are higher priority yeah. for people. So the art right. history gets translated last. All right, thank you. I have another question. Uh, Jim Plummer, I am in, in, and this question refers to uh, EDX. Um, EDX uses the most restrictive and least used open source license. Have you ever considered something broader and more commonly used? Uh, so you're referring to the AGPL license? Yes. So uh, the, the there's a spectrum of uh, options when you're looking at license choices. Uh, they're open, uh, free and open can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. Uh, the AGPL license, uh, it is, it may be seen as restrictive by some, but it is intended to uh, foster a larger community of contribution. Um, the, the, the sort of options that we have in front of us, just if you're not super familiar with open source licensing, um, on one end of the spectrum are the GPL licenses, and on the other, and the, another end of the spectrum is uh, Apache. So with an Apache licensed software product, uh, you can take that piece of software, you can do anything that you want to it, um, and deploy it, run it, whatever, and there's no restriction, there's no requirement that you open source the changes that you made to that piece of software. Uh, the AGPL license is, uh, has that restriction. So uh, what it says is you can take and run this software as is. Uh, you can do whatever you want to it. If you modify it and if you take that modification and are running it, the, uh, you must open source that change that you made. And the goal, because this, this, this all comes down to um, Richard Stallman uh, and his philosophy of uh, free and open software, and his philosophy is that the user has a right to see the software that they are running and to be able to examine it. And so he, in designing the GPL licenses, was looking out for the interests of the user of the software and trying to uh, encourage the ability of a user to understand what they are accessing or executing uh, when they're using that software. So uh, you know, there's two effects that, uh, in choosing the AGPL license. There's the freedom uh, and openness for the user, and then there's the uh, impact to the community in terms of encouraging people to make their contributions public. And those are the reasons why we chose the AGPL. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'm on the open OSI board, it's always fun to hear licensing talk. It's exciting. <laughs> and appreciate you taking time to explain. Hi. Hi, I have not a question about licensing, although I'm a huge fan of the AGPL, so I, you know, <laughs> in case you, lest you think that we're all curious in that regard. Um, I'm wondering what folks think about uh, how to get the institutions that are not in this room to participate in their specific projects. Because obviously here we have a room full of folks who have demonstrated interest in being more open, but maybe there's some stumbling blocks, real or imagined, or I'm just curious what, uh, 
what do each of the projects think about getting the next batch of people in? All right, so any comments about inclusivity? What, what are your plans for broadening your project? Do you wanna start? I've, I've managed to, um, to get those from outside of our institution to do some collaboration by um, asking the faculty members who are doing projects if they know colleagues that they'd like to work with at other institutions. And so that's really, really went well, um, especially with some of our junior faculty who haven't been out of grad school for too long. Mm -hmm. uh, they can contact those that they were in grad school with, uh, who they already know that they work well with, and they can get, get going on some projects together. That's been one way for, for me to do it. Cool, all right, Joel? Um, so for the OpenEdX project, uh, you know, uh, actually, contributing code to the to the project is um, is a, a challenge uh, for sure. You have to be a, a pretty sophisticated developer. Um, we have a lot of requirements. I mean, we are operating at a very large scale, so performance considerations that uh, may not come into play for your use case, uh, you know, are you're required to meet those in order for us to accept your contribution. Uh, so we do uh, really look to find other ways of, of getting people to contribute to the project. Um, you know, there are opportunities to contribute to documentation, opportunities to contribute. Um, we do uh, have uh, crowdsourced translations. Uh, tran we use TransFX for that. Um, mm. And uh, and then there's uh, the content. So we have a large number of courses that are uh, available in uh, the OLX format, which is the format that we use uh, within um, the Open edX platform uh, to represent courses and content, um, and so those are those are some of the ways that we, we encourage people to, to get involved. All right, thanks, Beth. What do you think, or Stephen? So, um, coming to things like this is one. Uh, our curriculum design for the minor and some of the classes, the materials are online and downloadable. They're all open source, we wrote some software called Of Course, uh, which you can find in a GitHub repository, which um, once you've installed it by someone who is, you know, Linux or otherwise technically proficient, makes building the course website simple by just dropping in a list of URLs and stuff for the reading materials and, and things like that. Um, it uses GitHub for submissions, so we eat the open source dog food in terms of doing the homework for that, right? We use the tools. It's got a, a system by which one of the things we have students do is um, blog weekly, and there's a, a piece of the software that after they've written a YAML file to, to get added to the list, automatically checks for their blog posts and gives both them and us a kind of red, yellow, and green dashboard in terms of how up to date they are on their blog posts and all of that's out there. Um, so, and then going around talking about what we do and hoping other people will will climb on in terms of teaching this type of material. All right, thanks. So you're looking for people to adopt your stuff as well as contribute to it. Or, okay. or you know, fork and make better, right? There you go. What we find is, is that, and this happens with lots of different areas of expertise, after a while, there's this kind of faculty assumption that <clears throat> the kids know how to do that, right? <laughs> you know, and that's, that's probably, if there's one issue I've come up with in the last couple of years, though certainly not when I started, um, uh, the kids know how to do that. There's this, and the kids assume that because, um, I'm sorry, students, some people find kids disrespectful. Um, Considering I let them tell me what they want to learn, clearly I'm not disrespectful, but I do have that bad habit. So, um, you know, the, the assumption that just because they all have GitHub accounts and because they all use open source software, they know that whole other side of licensing and what being a member of a community or what being a contributor really is. And again, that's contributor in any sense of the word, where they're editing websites because programmers don't always have the best grammar, or whether they're contributing non-programmer art icons, you know, whatever it happens to be, right? The assumption is they all already know how to do that, and they don't. They don't attach licenses to their stuff. They, they don't discuss that stuff. So um, that's one of the things we're really trying to push, not so much that you, you know, 
use my courseware per se or use my collection of reading lists or what have you, but that we all kind of propagate the message that um, they really don't know how to do that. Yeah. Right. Thank Not you. all of them anyway. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, thanks sorry, for the I, question. I, just wanna, oh, okay. I, I was just going to build a little bit more on, um, on some of the things that we do uh, for Open Edx. I think one of the really important things that we do is um, uh, just enabling others uh, to spread the word. Um, you know, we actually, we've partnered with, uh, so Bitnami is a organization that takes things like WordPress and Open edX and whatever and packages them up. You can sort of do a one-click deploy. There's a whole ecosystem around uh, the Open edX platform. Uh, that means that we're not the only ones that are going out there and uh, evangelizing about uh, the, the product and the platform. Um, and I, I think that's a really important thing. And, um, and then also sort of building um, on the, the concept of dog pooting, we, we do have on uh, edX.org, uh, free for anyone to take, we have a uh, MOOC on building MOOCs and a uh, MOOC on uh, video production. Um, and uh, we also uh, have a really strong emphasis on, on documentation. So I think all of those things are important also. All right, thanks. So we have just enough time for one last excellent question and some really quick answers. <laughs> I'll try to make it as excellent as I can. Um, it's a question primarily, I think, for Diana and, and Beth. Uh, one of the things that traditional publishers provide is uh, editorial support and a set of editorial standards. Uh, how in the kinds of uh, open projects that you're, uh, that you're uh, conducting, do you provide that kind of editorial consistency? What's your, what's your model and how is that compensated? So for us, we actually, we have 20, probably more than, might be close to 25 now contributing editors because you don't want me editing something on Chinese art or something. So, um, so we have 20, 25 people who have various areas of expertise and we run everything by them. So I don't know, I think there's maybe, there's a black and white thing, peer reviewed, not peer reviewed, and maybe there's a whole gray area in between. We're reading it, we're art historians with PhDs with 25 years of teaching experience each. It goes by someone else. It's not really blind peer review and it's not really research we're publishing, but um, we do very serious editing, make, making sure the tone is right and appropriate, uh, making sure the level is right, um, and, and doing fact checking and things like that. So, and all uncompensated. And I'm with everyone here who wants to think of a new model to compensate content creators. Mm -hmm. All right, thank, thank you so much. Any other comments from the panel? Yeah, so Peter. for me, if they, um, if this is a project that they're working on with our university press, it goes through the university press's process. Mm -hmm. So the editorial board, the editors there, all of that. Um, and then for projects that aren't going through the press, for, one, for uh, book projects that are just going through, my unit, um, we have editors that we contract with and we cover that cost. Um, the other thing about it is both for the press and for projects um, through me, we have them turn in a list of at least three peer reviewers um, because we don't know who, who is um, in that area who mm -hmm. could review a text. And then I contact them and I offer them a small amount of funding, usually about $200, if they would review the text um, and answer a list of questions. Um, the review process that we use for that is really the one that's, um, it was first done by BC Campus, but it is also, I think it's available on the Open Textbook Initiative site. So the Open Textbook Initiative, for those who aren't familiar with it, you can find, I think it's 118 institutions who are working together on open textbooks. And the, uh, the site is run by the University of Minnesota. And so if you search for the Open Textbook Initiative, you can find it there. And it's really, it's a rubric that the peer reviewers go through. And that also uh, counteracts the argument from faculty who said that uh, open textbooks can't be any good and that they can't be good if it's free because we ask for peer review and those are names um, of other faculty they know. Great, thank you. Yeah, and just for our stuff, we don't have formal peer review, obviously, for the things we put out there, but um, we have an ongoing relationship with Red Hat. We usually check in with them on industry practice. We work with other faculty members as well, just to make sure that we're uh, 
we're not putting out a single vision of how this stuff should work. Thank you. All right, thank you. I want to thank the panelists for sharing your experience and your wisdom, and let's give a hand. And housekeeping, we going to the next panel, or is there a break? Gentlemen? Discussion. <laughs>